Um, but I'm a professor at the University of Washington. I'm in the School of Environmental and Forest Sciences there, which is in a new College of the Environment. We've been at college for, I guess, five years now, something like that. Um, but it's a fun place to be. You get to work with lots of interesting people, and you'll see some of that collaboration uh, in my talk tonight. And I'll take a break, I guess, about quarter after. And um, I'll go get through the hard stuff before the break. So uh, there will be some anatomy. There will be some brain terminology. Uh, to start off with, but I hope that just gives you a better perspective on what these animals are able to do and how they do it. And then we'll have lots of fun stories and art and pictures and you'll be able to um, to relax again. But the quiz will be, I guess, right before the break. <laughs> so I'd like to start with this short little video clip first. And what you're going to see in this is a New Caledonia crow. So not the crows we have here, but a different species. And this is a species that especially makes tools and uses tools to get insects and things like that from under the bark. There aren't woodpeckers on the islands where this animal lives. So it uses uh, bits of plant matter and stems and things to, um, to get insects that woodpeckers might otherwise get here. And it's going to be presented with a problem that you'll see when the video starts. There's a clear tube, and that bird wants to get food out of the bottom of that tube. And it only has available to do that a piece of wire. So I want you to see how it solves the problem. So it's got a straight piece of wire. It's just trying to use it maybe as a spear like it would in the wild to, to spear the worm that's in that little bucket. And I want you to think what you would do at this point if that's not working, which it, it isn't for this bird. What's the next strategy? <laughs> Scream for help. <laughs> and the hook. Knock, on, knock over the glass. <laughs> Make a <laughs> Smarter than most of the presidential candidates. <laughs> size of animals on the y-axis against the body size of them on the x here. And there's a standard relationship uh, where small animals have small brains and big animals have big brains. But there's a lot of scatter around that. And some of it's due to the kind of animal. So for example, fish, here's the average line for fish, small to big fish. And they on average have smaller brains than birds, which are smaller than mammals and smaller yet than primates like us and other uh, apes. And even though within a group like the birds, there's a lot of variation. So here's a big bird with a small brain, the ostrich. You can think of that bird, probably not the smartest one out there. And then there are other birds like the ones I just told you about. Uh, the New Caledonia crow is right here on this graph. Very large brain for its body size if it was a typical bird. Much more on the line with mammals. And some of these, like our American crow that we have here, or the, or the raven we just heard about, these are up closer to the primate line. So really, they're like small flying monkeys as opposed to birds because of the size of their brain relative to their body. It's still a very small brain. It's the size of your thumb. But for their body size, it's big. And that allows them to do some extra things besides just coordinate that body and, and solve their, their typical problems. And so the other birds that are up here are things like the macaws, the big parrots. They also have big brains. And you think of those as being pretty smart birds as well. But all of the corvids, the crows, ravens, jays, magpies, they all have uh, large brains for their body size. You can rest happy that ours is even well above that line. <laughs> um, but the porpoise is right there. <laughs> so why, uh, why also would these animals maybe do some of the same things we are able to do with our brain? Not only is it big, but it shares the same architecture that ours does. And that's what I want to tell you a little bit about. And that's because we had a common ancestor that developed a brain of all the vertebrates here. The first ancestral vertebrate was a, was a type of amphibian, or fish actually before this, but amphibian on land. And that gave rise to modern amphibians some 350 million years ago. Then as amphibians transitioned to reptiles, and I should point out the drawings you'll see here, the black and whites are all done by uh, my friend Tony Angel, who's an artist in the Seattle area. And what Tony's drawn here are the kind of stem reptiles that gave rise to these other vertebrates. So here's a mammal-like reptile that gave rise to mammals, including us, uh, long ago. 
And um, since mammals evolved, then more modern reptiles, and finally birds evolved from dinosaur-like reptiles. So this has been a progression, and what Tony's drawn in each brain case here is just the, the anatomy of the brain in basic shape. There's a brain stem, there's a big hemisphere that we think with our uh, cerebrum, and then there's this cerebellum in the back, this curly thing that hangs down in the back like a grapefruit that coordinates a lot of our actions and movements. So all of these vertebrates have those basic parts. And the crows, like us, have a big forebrain. That's what they have that's unique. And that's what's shown here. And I'll, I'll show it to you two ways. Here's a radiograph of uh, the brain of a crow as it's thinking about things that it's looking at that I worked with um, some folks in the Department of Radiology at the university to, to obtain. And this animal's got these bright areas in its brain. You can see there's two hemispheres. These are its eyes, which are almost as big as the brain. And birds really have huge eyes, although you only see a little piece of them that sticks out of their, their eyelids. But they've got a big eye behind that that's collecting all this information. And then these bright areas on each hemisphere of the brain are what's processing that information. And you have that same sort of thing in your brain, a place that's special for processing vision, some that's special for scent, some for noise, and um, the brain works on those in, in kind of different places, and then it integrates them. And what Tony's drawn here inside the crow's brain, again, is this very large forebrain, all this gray matter, and then uh, the more primitive part of the brain here that's shared with all vertebrates. But this gray matter is different than ours. It's not convoluted on the outside, but it's got similar functions, and it's made of the same tissue, the same nerve cells. They do the same things with the same chemicals uh, that communicate in their brain that happens in ours. So the basic way this works, and these will be the, uh, these will be the terms that will be on the quiz, so you might want to pay attention. <laughs> uh, as information comes in through nerves, for example, from the eye or the ear, they go to special places. From the eye, this is that bright spot you saw in the radiograph. Uh, it, it works on visual information. If it's from the ear, it would be worked on in this part of the bird's brain. And so the word, bird's processing all this different sensory information is trying to make sense of it and use it to, to do something, to command activity. And it does that by forming connections between neurons or nerve cells in different parts of the brain. And Tony's just illustrated that with a few of these uh, caricatures of, of nerve cells. So maybe up here where visual information is processed, it connects with another part of the brain where uh, vocal or sound information is processed. That might also coordinate with part of the brain that, that is important to um, emotion. The amygdala of the bird's brain is the same as your amygdala that you have that, that processes your emotional feeling. And memory, the hippocampus of the bird's brain. You have a hippocampus as well that you use to remember things and navigate with. And the bird has one too. And by making connections among all these parts, physical connections between the nerve cells and the chemicals that communicate between those cells, Birds can form these kind of emotionally charged and spatially relevant memories that are of various sights and sounds or smells or other kinds of um, sensory inputs that they get, just like, just like you.